The yeas are 46, the nays are 48, three-fifths of the senators duly chosen and sworn not having voted. In the affirmative, the motion is not agreed to. And it might be the last chance for Democrats to codify it before the Supreme Court rules on it later this year. The vote to invoke cloture on the motion failed 46 to 48. All Republicans voted no, and Joe Manchin, the Democrat senator out of West Virginia, was the only Democrat to join Republicans in also voting no. Not surprisingly, this led to a ton of hate. Joe Manchin. Joe Manchin. I'm up, and Joe Manchin can seriously go f Amy Klobuchar would have gotten enough votes. I'm not sure I understand that one. Look, I'm all for telling Maserati-driving, yacht-living Joe Manchin to f It feels great. Look, like, it's very cathartic. He's a piece of He's standing in the way of so many things that would make people's lives better. Joe Manchin. What if I told you there's even more people you should be angry with? We'll get to those people in a second, but let's get into why this is important and what's at stake. In December, the Supreme Court heard oral arguments in Dobbs v. Jackson Women's Health Organization, a case out of Mississippi. And that case is examining whether all pre-viability restrictions on elective abortions are unconstitutional. And Mississippi is in the Supreme Court because they passed a law in 2018 that would restrict abortion after 15 weeks. And this is earlier than the trimester framework laid out in Roe v. Wade. So there was a constitutional issue at play. And recently we saw Texas pass a six-week abortion ban, which is patently unconstitutional, but it hasn't made its way to the Supreme Court yet. So right now they're looking at the Mississippi law. But what's so dangerous about this is Mississippi asked in its brief to the Supreme Court for the court to completely overturn Roe v. Wade. This sets up a scenario where over 20 states could immediately ban abortion if the court rules in Mississippi's favor. Right now, 12 states already have laws on the books that are set to go in place if and when Roe v. Wade is ever overturned that would completely outlaw abortion in those states. And some states have pre-Roe era bans that could be reinforced should the court overturn Roe v. Wade. And you'd think, with how common these laws are, that in America, abortion isn't as popular as it actually is. Most Americans oppose overturning Roe v. Wade. In fact, 56% of Americans oppose any restrictions on abortion after 18 weeks. And this isn't just a partisan thing. Only 27% of Republicans support a total ban on abortion, but that's effectively what they're guaranteeing here. And this effort in Congress to codify Roe and protect abortion rights at the federal level is another instance of how Congress doesn't really reflect the political will in America. There are just a handful of Republicans in Congress who purportedly support abortion rights, and two of them are in the Senate, Lisa Murkowski from Alaska and Susan Collins from Maine. And you'd think, given their lip service to this issue, that they might have supported this, but last night they voted to kill it. As we've seen in Congress time and time again, when somebody has a different view from their party and is forced to vote on it, they find an excuse or a reason why they can't, and that same excuse was deployed here. Despite claiming they want to help codify Roe, Murkowski and Collins voted against this effort and proposed their alternative because they said the bill that the Democrats were proposing was too broad and would have somehow infringed on religious freedom. So they voted against it and then proposed their own version of it, which will likely not see the light of day. There are a couple issues here. First, the filibuster. Democrats don't have a filibuster-proof majority, so they're either going to have to find more votes from the Republicans, which on this issue isn't going to happen, or change the Senate rules to get rid of the filibuster altogether. And we've seen how Manchin and Cinema like to pretend that the filibuster is some sacrosanct, hallowed tradition in the Senate, and in reality, it's just not. It's not in the Constitution. It came later and was weaponized by segregationists over the years. This is a tool rooted in white supremacy, and right now, it's impeding progress. But the Biden administration has also been selective, and when they call for the filibuster to be either removed or changed or flat out ignored for pieces of legislation that support their agenda. Recently, the Biden administration said that they should change the rules to pass voting rights. But on the issue of codifying Roe, they were silent on this issue. 
And it's really frustrating because with time running out and people's health and bodily autonomy on the line, this is something that they should absolutely prioritize. But this didn't happen overnight. This is a fight that's been going on for years. Jerry Falwell and Paul Wyrick, two conservative moral majority figures, tried to weaponize this and did so successfully in Reagan's election over Carter and has successfully turned this into this hyper-partisan issue that Republicans have run on for decades. This was their ultimate goal. They have been telegraphing their past for years, and Democrats have traditionally governed from a position of fear, being too afraid to touch this issue, being too afraid to do anything severe regarding codifying Roe. The closest Democrats came to codifying Roe, and the one person who actually expressed that they wanted to do this and had the power to do it was when Barack Obama was elected president and had a supermajority. And look, you might be saying, well, that's very easy for you to say in 2022. So take a look at this. What would you do at the federal level, not only to ensure access to abortion, but to make sure that the uh, judicial nominees that you will inevitably be able to pick are true to the core tenets of Roe v. Wade? Well, the first thing I'd do as president is, is sign the Freedom of Choice Act. Uh, that's the first thing that I'd do. That bill they're referring to, the Freedom of Choice Act, would have codified Roe. Then, once Obama took office in 2009, he said this. Thank you, Mr. President. In a couple of weeks, you're going to be giving uh, the commencement at Notre Dame. And as you know, this has caused a lot of controversy among Catholics who are opposed to your position on abortion. As a candidate, you vowed that one of the very first things you wanted to do was sign the Freedom of Choice Act, which, as you know, would eliminate federal, state, and local restrictions on abortion. Uh, now, the Freedom of Choice Act is not my highest legislative priority. I believe that uh, women should have the right to choose, uh, but uh, I think that uh, the most important thing we can do to tamp down some of the, um, the anger surrounding this issue uh, is to focus on those areas that we can agree on, uh, and that's, uh, that's where I'm going to focus. And this is what I mean when I say they govern for my position of fear. He's too afraid that he might flare up tensions in the country. But the thing is, this was something they knew was going to be a long-term risk and something they needed to do because it's the right thing to do. And they chose not to. Other legislative priorities for Obama were a Rube Goldberg machine they called health care reform, bailing out the banks, and very little else. But sadly, codifying Roe did not make the cut. And now we're in this position. Now we're in a position where the Supreme Court in just a couple of months could completely overturn it. And Democrats may have just lost their last chance to do so. Ultimately, this boils down to bodily autonomy. And it's extremely frustrating to see people brand the Republican Party as the party of freedom and liberty and individual choices. But that typically only extends to what guns you can buy, what truck you can drive, what people you can be bigoted or racist toward, and whether or not you should have to wear a mask at a restaurant. But this notion that Republicans are the individual choice and freedom party is totally delusional, because what's more representative of individual choice and autonomy than making a private decision in your doctor's office without government interference? You'd think this is something a freedom party would love, but it was never about that. It's about weaponizing this issue for political gain. It always has been. 